All right, in this video, we're going to see how to do double integrals over general regions. This video corresponds with section 5.2 of the OpenStax textbook Calculus Volume 3. So we're going to need to look at uh, what are called type 1 and type 2 regions. Uh, and then from there, we can go to general bounded regions. Uh, and then for rectangles, we can even go unbounded. So we'll do a quick review of double integrals over rectangular regions, which was covered in the last video. So our domain is a rectangle where x goes from a to b and y goes from c to d. And the double integral over this region represents the volume between the surface, the floating sheet up in space, and the xy plane. So this volume, it's kind of shaded here. Um, you know, in theorem 5.1, we laid out some properties of double integrals, like you could distribute them over a sum and you could factor off a constant and things like that. <clears throat> so we're going to use some of those. Uh, and in theorem 5.2, uh, we said that the double integral over this rectangular region was equal to both of the iterated single in integrals, so that you could take the function and integrate with respect to y and then integrate with respect to x. Um, and you could do the order either way, and it would give you the same result. So if these limits of integration go from A to B and C to D and sort of define a rectangle, uh, then the big question is how would you deal with it if it was not a rectangle? Uh, well, theoretically, let's say we have some non-rectangular region D that we'd like to integrate over. So again, we're just looking at the XY plane from above here. Um, and what we can do is, if it's bounded, uh, say the region D is bounded, then that means that we can put a rectangle around it, outside of it. Uh, we'll call that rectangle R. And then the function we're integrating is F, but we're going to define a new function piecewise so that on the interior of D, uh, F is equal to G. And then out here, outside of D, where F's not defined, we're just going to say that G is equal to zero. So there's the definition of G. It's F inside of D, and it's zero outside of D. Uh, now, using property three from theorem 5.1, uh, if the rectangular region we're integrating over can be broken into a union of two subsets, so that the intersection is the empty set except for the boundary, uh, then we can break the double integral of the rectangle up into the double integral of those two sets. Well, that's exactly what we have here. Uh, this rectangle R can be broken up into D, which is sort of like S in this theorem, and then this outer part, uh, which is the complement of uh, D with respect to R. Uh, in set theory, you can write this as r slash d. It's kind of like r minus d. So it's this whole part out here uh, that's outside of d but inside of r. And so those two pieces together have a union of r. And so we can break the integral of r up into those. Right? And we're doing this with the function g, by the way. Now, inside the, the little uh, curved region d, g is equal to f. And so I'm actually able to change g and f uh, on that integral right there because this is an integral over d. And they're identical on that inter interval, or sorry, in that region. So we can change g to f there with no problem. Now, what about this other integral? Well, g was defined to be 0 outside. And that's what this is. This is the outside area. So the integral of 0 is just going to be 0. And so that won't actually have any effect. Uh, at the end, we basically just say that, well, the integral of f over this non-rectangular region d <clears throat> is equal to the integral of g over rectangular region r. This is a powerful theorem in that it lets us imagine that every non-rectangular region, there is some other function g and there is some other rectangle r uh, where we can now use all the properties of rectangular regions uh, for our non-rectangular regions. All we need is that the uh, region is bounded. 
So that includes the definition of the double integral, right? The definition of this is already defined in 5.1. We can now bring it over here to non-rectangular regions for F. Uh, all those properties in theorem 5.1, those worked for this integral. And so therefore they'll work in the non-rectangular region version there. Uh, and so we have all the theory we need, but I still don't know how I'm actually gonna take the integrals because the iterated integral process went from A to B and C to D, and I don't have hard limits like that anymore. So this is where we have to talk about type one and type two regions. Type one regions will be bounded above and below by functions of X. We use G one of X for the bottom and G two of X for the top. Uh, and then X goes from A to B. Now, you see that uh, it could be that it looks like a vertical line on the two sides, but it could be that the two functions just meet and you don't get a vertical line. So these are all examples of type one regions. In the set theory notation, we'd say that the region D is the set of all points where X is between A and B and Y is between G1 and G2. So if we can write the shape out like this, it's considered a type one region. Uh, another type we have is type two, and here it's bounded on the left and right by functions of y. On the left, uh, we have h1 of y, and on the right, we have h2 of y. Now, y itself goes from c to d, which again could be horizontal lines, or it could be that there's just a point where the two functions of y intersect. <clears throat> so these are both examples of type two regions. In the set theory notation, we say that D is the set of all points where Y is between Z and D and X is between H1 and H2. All right, so we're gonna do some concept check questions where we show you a region, a two dimensional region, and then you try to identify it as type one, type two, neither or both. So what do you think of this region? So the correct answer here is B, that this is a type two region where H1 would be negative 10 plus Y and H2 is 10 minus Y. Uh, C would be zero and then D would be 10. How about this region? So the correct answer here is neither. If you try to think of this as a type one region, then you see that uh, you would have to have a piecewise defined function for the left side. Uh, and we really wanna try to avoid that when possible. Um, this would work for an H2 on the right side, um, but you wouldn't be able to have a non-piecewise H1. In terms of writing this as a type one, uh, it fails the vertical line test here, and so this couldn't be thought of as uh, G1 or G2. So the correct answer is neither. Uh, we will deal with shapes like this by breaking them up into smaller subregions. Uh, the subregions are then considered type one or type two, and that's how you deal with this. How about this one? So this would be primarily thought of as a type one uh, where G1 would be the negative one plus X squared. Remember G1 is the bottom. And then G2 is zero, which is the top. Uh, A goes from negative one to B, which is one. Now you could invert this equation and write X as the negative square root of, or sorry, X as the plus or minus square root of Y plus one. And then H1 could be the negative square root over here. And then H2 could be the positive square root. But when you have the choice between uh, type one or type two, we usually pick type one because we're used to functions of X. Um, also, it'd be easier to deal with a square than a square root. And it's the last one. And the answer here is both, uh, that you could think of uh, y equals x to the fourth is g1, and y equals sine of x is g2, in which case this is type one, and a goes from zero to b, which is one. You could also think of this as a type two region, 
uh, where H1 is the inverse sine of Y and H2 is the fourth root of Y. And then C is zero and D is up here uh, at this intersection point, which looks like about 0.8. Uh, again, when you have the choice, you're probably gonna pick type one and it would be probably easier to deal with uh, these functions rather than their inverses. All right, so time to actually set up iterated integral process. Uh, Fubini's theorem 5.4, the strong form of Fubini's tells us that we can do the iterated integral process, but instead of having all constants for the limits, the first integral we do will actually have functions for the limits. And you saw this with the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, uh, and we're now bringing this back in calc three. Now the variable that appears in these functions is the second variable that you would integrate with respect to. So integrating with respect to y, there shouldn't be y's up here, just x's. And then those x's get integrated in the next step. Your second integral should always have constants. Notice here we have y's and that's the second variable of integration. Again, we can do this either way and we should get the same result. So we do it whichever way is easier. We'll see how to do that in the methodology for double integrals. And that concludes this presentation by Matthew Watts, which contains images and text from Calculus Volume 3 by Jed Herman and G. Strange, CC BY NCSA OpenStax.